Darktable 3.6 now has a new module called Color Balance RGB. It replaces the old Color Balance module. And in this video, we're going to have a quick dive through all of the new features. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 98 of Understanding Darktable. This is my third attempt at this video. Patrons on tiers three and four, I'm going to give you the complete unedited version that was the previous take because it's a much more deeper dive. This is going to be a very quick dive just to, I don't know, just get through the basics, I guess. What I would recommend if you want more information is to watch Aurelian's video, which I will link to in the comments down below. It is quite a lengthy video and it's quite in depth, covers a lot of the color science. And Aurelian does say, if you don't understand the color science, this is not the module for you. Uh, it's quite technical. Anyway, enough of that. Let's just get into it, shall we? I have got this image here, which is from my Little Red Riding Hood shoot that I did a few years ago with Armour. And I've got a previously processed version of the image, which looks like that, which I'm now not particularly happy with because there's certainly no detail in the skirt here. Uh, all that color is just blown out horribly. So I've created a duplicate, reset the file. So if we look here, all we've got is the regular stuff with maybe filmic. That would be the only thing that's you know, changing the nature of the raw file. So in terms of the color balance module, the things that are important to understand is that you definitely want to get your white balance correct before you approach the color balance RGB module. The reason for that is because if your white balance isn't correct to begin with, then all of your hues are going to be messed up from the start and anything you try and do with the color is going to be playing from a, a less than advantageous starting point, shall we say. One of the interesting things about Darktable 3.6 is the addition of the vector scope. Now, I previously said that that really didn't interest me that much, but something that Aurelian mentioned in his video is that if your white balance is correct, the white point will be the very center of the vector scope. And if, you're, if you have got your white balance right, then all of the colors in your image should be mapped around the white point. And as we can see here, they are not. They're all around, you know, maybe two thirds of the, the circle, but the white point is on the edge. It's not in amongst all of the colors. So that gives us an indication that our white point is not correct. So what I would do then is check that white balance is on D65, which it is, then go to the color calibration module, click on the eyedropper, let color calibration do its thing. We can see it's changed the white balance and it actually now does look a little more like what it should have appeared like. And if we look at the vector scope, we can see that the colors are now distributed around that white point the way they should be. Okay, I will quickly just have a look at the relative white exposure here in Filmic. I'm probably going to push it to about there because I don't want the red of that skirt to just blow out and lose all of its detail again. Uh, the black point is pretty much right where it is. So I'm happy with that. Let's dive into the color balance RGB module. So you will notice that there are three tabs. There is the master tab, the four ways tab, and those two are for processing. And then there's the masks tab, which is sort of more of a utility tab. Okay, hue shift. This will basically allow you to change the hues of your image. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the intended application of this slider is for, because if you've got your white balance correct, why would you then want to go and rotate all of your hues like this? And 
it really is a case of rotation. If you watch the vector scope up the top there, you really are rotating your entire color palette around your white point. So if you have a use for it, knock yourself out. Next up, we've got the global vibrance. Now the global vibrance is very much like the saturation slider in the old color balance module. It affects saturation, but in this instance, it applies only to the pixels within your image that are not near the limits of their saturation already. So sort of neutral uh, saturation pixels, if that makes sense. So you'll notice that if I crank this up, these greens and blues of the grass in the background will respond much more than the reds of the cloak and the dress because the cloak and the dress are sort of nearing saturation already. So you can see that it affects those pixels which have medium levels of saturation much more than those which are already quite saturated. So that is the global vibrance. The contrast slider, it's recommended not to go near that if you are using filmic RGB because this will break anything that you have set up, come on, close up, uh, with regards your white relative exposure and your black relative exposure. The intention of the contrast slider, and it's just occurred to me I don't have Keymon running, my apologies. Uh, the contrast slider, you would only use that if you were going to run multiple instances of the color balance RGB module where you were going to mask it off to apply to one part of an image and then, you know, work on another instance of the color balance RGB module to work on other areas of the image. And you might therefore want to control contrast separately in different parts of your image. Okay, next we've got these three sections, linear chroma grading, perceptual saturation grading, and perceptual brilliance grading. Now, Aurelian did mention in his video a page that he has written for the Darktable manual, and again, I'll put a link to it in the comments, uh, called Color Definitions? Dimensions? Color Dimensions. And it has some quite technical reading about the differences between saturation and chroma and brilliance and luminosity and lightness and where these things overlap and where they diverge. I highly recommend you reading it if you've got the stomach for a heavy technical read. One thing to note is that the, the saturation control will darken as it saturates, as you increase the saturation value, and it will lighten as you decrease the saturation value. So just to demonstrate that, if I use the global saturation and I take it negative, you can see that all of those colors lightened up. It's like you've mixed everything with white. If we increase the saturation, everything gets darker like you were mixing in more black. The chroma grading, on the other hand, won't affect the luminosity. It will simply adjust the intensity of the color, but without adjusting its luminosity. Then you have, for each of these, a shadows, mid-tones, and highlights slider. So if all you want to do is affect the chroma of your shadows, for example, or just your mid-tones, then you could use the appropriate slider rather than using the global control, which will affect all of the pixels in your image. As I mentioned before, the saturation control will darken or lighten the pixels as you increase or decrease the saturation, and that is what the perceptual brilliance is for. So if you have, let's say, increase the saturation in the mid-tones and that's made it all a bit darker, then you might want to increase the mid-tone brilliance to bring some of that lightness back up. Again, it's a case of a little bit of everything goes a long way and the balance is up to you. All right, moving on to the four ways tab. This tab is designed to be your color grading tool. If you want to go down that route of applying a color grade to an image or a bunch of images after you have got your white balance correct, 
then this is the tab for you. So what you would do here is you would say, I want to introduce a hue to my image and you would then crank up the chroma and you could crank it up to extreme levels if you wanted to whilst you found the hue that you wanted to impart. You might go, that's the sort of color I want and now I can just simply dial in as much chroma as I want to give me as much of that effect as I'm after. You also have a luminance control there which will darken or brighten the image and then you have shadows and highlights. So this is essentially the replacement for the old shadows and highlights module now because the color balance RGB module, as you should have expected, works for a scene referred workflow where all of those modules that it's now replacing were all written for display referred workflows. So if you just want to work on the shadow tones, like let's say you wanted to do the tried and trusted and now completely worn out teal and orange look, uh, you could go, okay, I want teal in the shadows and I'm going to introduce something like this and then I'm going to find a bit of a, an orange tone and I'm going to introduce that to my highlights. You know, up to you. I don't particularly like this look and it's not something I would be doing to my images, but if that's what you want to do, knock yourself out. And then we have the power control, which again seems to change the luminance somewhat. And again, you can change hue and chroma for that as well. Finally, we have the masks tab. This masks graph basically has three masks. The shadows mask, which starts in the top left, comes down through the middle and finishes at bottom right. The highlights mask, which starts at the top right, comes down through the middle and finishes at bottom left. And then the mid-tones graph, which just peaks through the middle of the graph, and that's it. Now, what is that actually showing you? What it's showing you is luminosity from blacks to whites across the x-axis, or, or sorry, really from your from your deepest shadows to your brightest highlights. And then on the vertical axis, the transparency of the mask. So if we look at the highlights mask, which starts over here in the top left, when you're looking at the brightest pixels in your image, so the highlights, the mask will be at 100% opacity. And by the time you get down to your mid tone luminosities in the image, the mask will be at 50% opaque, 50% transparent. And by the time you get down to the deepest, darkest shadows, the mask will be completely transparent. The shadows mask is the opposite of that. It's completely opaque when your luminosities are at their darkest. It's at middle values when your luminosities are at middle values. And by the time you get to the highlights of your image, the shadows mask will be transparent. And the mid-tone curve, as you can see, only ever gets to around about 50% transparency, 50% opacity. Below that, we've got three sliders. The shadows fall off, the middle gray fulcrum, and the highlights fall off. Now, the first and last of those, the shadows fall off and the highlights fall off, they allow you to shallow out or to steepen the curve of that mask. And you can see that as you change the shadows fall off curve or the highlights fall off curve, so you are also affecting the middle gray curve as well. At any point, you can see what the mask is picking up by clicking on the little display icon on the right hand side. So this is the shadows mask that we are seeing. So any pixels that we can actually see here are going to be included in the shadows mask. If we go to the highlights mask, only these pixels here will be included in the highlights mask. And if we click the middle one, we're seeing the mid gray mask. Now, what does all of that mean? What do these masks actually mean? Well, the shadows and the highlights mask refer to the shadows and highlights section of the four ways mask. And the mid gray fulcrum slider only applies in these 
nine sliders here, the shadows, midtones, and highlight sliders of the linear chroma, the perceptual saturation, and the perceptual brilliance sections on the master tab. Okay, so that is a very quick run through of the color balance RGB module. Uh, for the patrons, I will give you some demonstrations of this in action. And I do want to mention, and I know this is going to ruffle some feathers. <sighs> I was watching one of Rico's videos the other day, and he was talking about the challenges that we face in life and the big events, things like getting married, having children, moving house, losing jobs, all that sort of stuff. And he's just gone through two of those where he's moved house and he's had a child. And me, I've just been retrenched, uh, which is, you know, not exactly what I wanted at this stage in my life, because once you're into your early 50s, you know, trying to find another job gets harder and harder. People don't want to employ people, you know, at this age because they realize they're only going to get another 10 or 15 years out of me before I retire. So it's got me thinking, what do I do from here? I've been an audio engineer for, well, since 1987. So depending on when you're watching this video, you can do the maths. A long time. And I'm very fortunate. I love what I do. Even as, as you know, even though I've worked in different areas as an audio engineer, I still love it. I absolutely still love what I do. But I'm now starting to think, do I want to go looking for another job as an audio engineer or how realistic would it be for me to make this a full-time income stream? Now, to be honest, I'm still kicking around ideas as to how that might look, how it might work. One of the things I'm considering is to set up a website for understanding Darktable and to create a masterclass which would be a lot more in depth than what I have been covering in this video series on YouTube. Now, I mentioned before about it ruffling feathers. I know some people are going to go, oh, why are you trying to make money out of something that's free and open source? Well, I'm not trying to make money off Darktable. I am hoping to make some money out of what I do with my time, which is to help people to learn. Now, I have said all along, I don't consider myself to be a guru. I'm a guy who loves the software. I'm just looking at options for what do I do with my life from here on out. Hopefully, some of you would be willing to support me in this venture. And some of you won't. And, and that's absolutely fine. You know, I don't expect you know, that what I do is going to appeal to everybody. Um, I don't know whether or not I really have the numbers yet to make a living out of this, but I'm going to give it a go. What have you got to lose, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at this point in time. Still kicking around, you know, how to execute this and how to make it work and what I can do to bring value to people. Because at the end of the day, you know, if I don't bring value, then nobody's going to support what I do. And that's absolutely fair, too. Um, for those people who are currently patrons, I will be working out a way whereby, depending on what tier you are at, you will get some level of access to the masterclass. And I would imagine tier three and tier four supporters will get full access. Uh, so yeah, lots of things to think about. Uh, none of it is absolutely nailed down yet. A lot of it is just random ideas flitting around in my brain. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to let you know where I'm at with, you know, with this and what I'm going to do going forward. Alrighty. I think that will do for now. Questions, comments, feedback, please sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.